So I'm going to be talking about um, Lustre and basically starting off where Peter's talk finished, um, starting about the roadmap and uh, what's going into Lustre 2.3 and um, you know, talking a little bit about what these features are. Um, you know, as you can see, there is quite a number of features and um, I think for some people, you know, who aren't following closely along, you know, you see this description, it says OSD restructuring, what does that mean, right? And then at the end, um, I'll have a little bit about, you know, what's in 2.5 and what's potentially, you know, coming in the pipeline in the future. Um, so targeting for our next um, six month feature release, um, there's a number of, of um, development areas that are already well underway and um, the first one is uh, something that sort of was a, a interesting addition um, is uh, client code cleanup um, you know as you can imagine with a project like Lustre it's been uh, you know 12 years so far in the making and um, you know we've had to you know migrate our code started with uh, with Linux kernel 2.4.9 or something like that Red Hat 3 maybe and um, you know it's incrementally grown you know over the years to support all of the intermediate kernels and that's left you know sometimes you know a mess in its wake and you know we still had um, configuration checks for features that have been obsolete in the kernel for you know five years already and so EMC has um, stepped forward and uh, dedicated some developers to um, cleaning up, you know, the client code and, um, you know, making it uh, more suitable for newer kernels. And um, their goal is, is to try and get um, the Lustre client landed into an upstream Linux kernel um, at some point in the future. And we'll actually be talking a little bit about that um, in detail at uh, the technical working group meeting on Wednesday afternoon. Um, as well, there's ongoing work for the single server metadata uh, performance. Um, we've seen some of the benefits of that already in uh, Lustre 2.2, um, parallel directory operations and things, and that's continuing forward um, with a focus on uh, improving um, SMP scaling. You know, as everybody knows, cores aren't getting faster anymore. They're just getting more and more of them. And so that's putting increased pressure on internal locking. Um, uh, Non-uniform memory access is becoming increasingly important. And so tuning the uh, server side um, is, uh, um, you know, the way to, to get more efficient hardware. I mean, currently, uh, I with at least with 2.1, I don't know if we've done a study with 2.2 yet, but you couldn't really get more performance than about eight to 10 or 12 cores on a MDS and um, you know we're, we're going to be pushing that up so you can really utilize the new hardware that's coming down the pipe. Um, online file system checking um, you know I apologize in advance for anybody who had to use or still has to use the, the existing LFS check I mean it's a functional tool but practically it, it doesn't scale to the needs that we have and it, it does have a number of um, warts that we want to get rid of and so OpenSFS has funded a project to do an online distributed file system checking tool and uh, to clarify this doesn't for LDISCFS you know ext4 based file systems it doesn't eliminate the need for um, doing a local disk check but what this tool is intended to do is to maintain consistency between um, you know the MDS and the OSS and you know missing objects or objects you know that were deleted from an FS check on an OST and you're still pointing to them from the the MDT and um, another area that came up with Luster 2.2 or Luster, well, Luster 2.x really is um, there's an internal um, configuration file uh, the object index and um, if you do a, a file system level backup and restore of your MDT um, you can't use your file system anymore. <laughs> so we recommend for 2.x that you uh, use a device level backup um, <coughs> until you know there's, there's a, a solution for that. 
And um, so the first phase in, in Lustre 2.3 is the OI scrub and some infrastructure for doing the, uh, the distributed checking. Um, there's more phases to actually do the distributed checking in Lustre 2.4 that will be coming up. Um, another new project for some people is the uh, the job ID statistics, and um, that's a project that we've started developing, um, actually well underway, and it's it's tying into um, job schedulers like Slurm or um, um, Moab and those kind of things, and it's a little bit of a hack because we're accessing the uh, application environment variable space from inside the, the client kernel, but um, the goal is to uh, transport, you know, the Slurm job ID to the OSTs and to the MDS, and so then you can get statistics on the servers that will tie directly into your job, um, your your job scheduler. And so that's something that you know lots of people have asked for because you know you get this load, you might know which IP address was at one point running, you know, some nasty job that was killing your servers with, you know. 1k IOs or something like that, but you can't tie it to which user or which job or you have to do it mi manually. Um, and, uh, you know, that does give us, you know, in the future potentially other kinds of, of um, hooks on the server side so we can tune IO or whatever based on the job ID. And so, of course, you know, that's not here yet, but it gives us a lot more useful information. Um, a really big project, you know, it's not done justice by the few lines here. There's going to be another presentation um, <coughs> later today on this about the OSD restructuring. And so what this really is, is uh, a continuation of some of the work that was done for Lustre 2.0 on the metadata server side um, to more cleanly abstract uh, the Lustre server code from the underlying file system. And uh, Lawrence Livermore <laughs> National Lab has been uh, spearheading this project, and the 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 immediate goal is running um, Lustre on top of ZFS. And um, the uh, the code that's that's currently targeted for for Lustre two three landing is um, the OST side code, and that um, you know. The goal, at least, is that you can run an OST on top of ZFS in, in Lustre 2.3. Um, you know, but if we don't quite make that goal, there's a, still a lot of infrastructure that has to land. You know, again, cleaning up all kinds of old, old interfaces, um, setting up a lot of the new infrastructure to integrate with, with how ZFS does its transaction models and things like that. And um, it's really mm -hmm. paving the way for um, you know, Lustre 2.4 is the target for having a full file system where all of the servers can run ZFS. Um, Zyrtex has been working recently on a project to uh, improve the, the client side and server side checksumming support. And, um, you know, that's, you know, in, in earlier versions of well, Lustre 2.2, there was, there was some improvement in the, in the checksum algorithm to allow um, hardware assistance, but there's still more infrastructure in the kernel that we can leverage um, to give us, you know, assembly language, uh, checksum code, and um, other improvements like that. And this is also more platform agnostic. Um, the the Lustre 2.2 code is like inline x86 assembly, but if you have a PowerPC, for instance, you don't get, you know, the benefits for the, the hardware assistance. And so the kernel has already done all that work and uh, we're, you know, taking advantage of it um, in 2.3. And, you know, as, as Peter had said, I mean, there's already a lot of other projects underway. I'm, you know, trying not to be um, over-optimistic in listing everything here, but there is the community, develop, um, commu community development um, wiki and so as projects, you know, our goal is, as projects are becoming, um, you know, very concrete and, and ready for landing, they get scheduled into a release. And before that time, you know, we don't want to impose pressure on people who are working on features. Um, you know, we don't want to 
you know, make false promises to uh, the users. And um, so, you know, this, this is not an exhaustive list of what's being worked on or what will necessarily be landed, but um, hopefully this is a, a, a list of things that are going to be landed and more features can still go in. Um, looking more forward to Lustre 2.4, that's almost a year away. Um, it's really a continuation of um, the, the previously mentioned projects and I think it's an important um, point to note is that all of the the projects that we're that we're um, working on and that we you know try to develop contracts for that they're they're incrementally um, beneficial and have intermediate milestones that uh, show you know real results and um, so uh, in in two four um, we'll be landing the uh, the MDS side. Um, changes for running on top of ZFS and um, then similarly continuing on with the distributed checking project LFS check will be able to do distributed you know online um, checking of the MDS inodes against the the OSS objects and um, you know this this is like if you consider a, a raid you know hardware raid systems they have you know online scrubbing of validity on the raid parity and things like that and and luster has built in um, consistency between the the metadata and data servers there's back pointers you know on the OSG objects that say which inode they belong to the inodes themselves have pointers to say which directory they belong into and what their file names are and so there's a num uh, you know bi-directional um, pointers that can be verified at runtime, and this can run in the background without, you know, significantly impacting your performance. But, you know, allows garbage collection in case of errors and that kind of thing as well. Um, a project that, you know, has been a long time in the making and is the distributed namespace. Um, I think in in earlier incantations, uh, incarnations, uh, we had a a too big a project all at one time and um, so we've we've broken it down uh, to deliver the first component of distributed namespace which is remote directories um, there's a presentation on this again uh, that I don't want to um, you know steal the thunder from but the basic idea is uh, you're you know it's sort of like a mount point in the sense that you have a directory entry that points to you know a directory on a remote server, but unlike having separate mount points and separate file systems, um, you know all of the files on any of the metadata servers can use all of the OSTs, so you can still get maximum bandwidth and you're sharing you know the resources there, but your your namespace is growing, you know to allow um, you know more files in a file system. You can isolate you know heavy metadata users and their applications from, you know, other poor victims that, you know, are facing the wrath of a 100,000 core job or something like that. And um, so more on that tonight or today. Uh, NRS, Network Request Scheduler, um, it may not be obvious from just what the name is, but it allows, it's like a, at the most basic level, it's a IO elevator for requests on the OSTs and allows you to more optimally um, process IOs from the clients if you have, you know, 100,000 cores in, you know, sending, you know, eight um, RPCs each at a time. You know, it's currently just FIFO and random IO to the disk. And this will give us, you know, some intelligence on the server side. But again, this is, is a foundation for all kinds of interesting um, features in the future like um, bandwidth, you know, limiting or guaranteed bandwidth for users or, um, you know, hosts or, you know, jobs, if we can tie it into the job ID and th that kind of thing. So it's, you know, an important feature by itself, but it gives you um, to, uh, in the future to do better things. Um, and another project from Zyrtex as well, four megabyte IOs. This is, you know, one of the orphans that uh, Peter Jones alluded to it was you know three quarters done 
at Sun and Oracle and then kind of sat on the shelf due to lack of testing or will to land it. And so they've picked up the pieces and are going to bring it to fruition. Um, you know, I've seen uh, reports, it's it, significant performance improvement on um, WAN systems due to round trip latency, but even on local file systems, you know, the, the reality is that the underlying disk system is much happier with four megabyte IO than with one megabyte IO. And so you can, you know, get an immediate improvement even on your existing hardware potentially. Um, continuing on with 2.4, so, you know, this is the obligatory slide about what's great about ZFS. Um, you know, with, I'm not mentioning ButterFS here. The truth is we, we had a, a look at ButterFS, um, you know, a year or so ago, and the code is really not, not ready for, for, you know, what we consider uh, for Lustre. It, it has, you know, their main goal and, you know, the, by, stated by the developers themselves is, uh, uh, you know, a desktop type workstation file system. You know, there's lots of cases, memory pressure, they don't handle that well, you know, assertions or whatever due to memory allocation failures. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's not on our short term horizon. Um, but even so, the OSD restructuring does give us the ability to move to ButterFS um, should there be interest. For ZFS, you know, the, the truth is that file systems, disk file systems, and, you know, let alone network file systems, um, you know, take five to ten years to become solid. And ZFS has passed that, you know, milestone. It's been in production on Solaris for a long time. And uh, Lawrence Livermore has done a, a great job about um, moving the ZFS code over to Linux. And so it's basically the same code. It has a wrapper around it that gives it a, you know, virtual Solaris, you know, locking and memory allocation and everything environment. So the core the ZFS code, you know, which is tried and true, doesn't have to be changed very much to integrate with, with Linux. And, you know, you get great features, of course, data checksumming, um, you know, on disk with the existing Lustre checksumming on the network. Um, ZFS also has online file system check and, you know, repair due to replication and RAID engine. And so, um, you know, that's one of the, the serious issues with, um, you know, availability if you have to, you know, take an outage and then you have to take another two hour window. I mean, to give credit, I mean, I love ext4 and e2fs progs, you know, I developed that myself. But, um, you know, we have kept pace on the LDISCFS side and the, the ext4 side um, with the increase in the sizes. I mean, we're up to 128 terabyte, you know, LUN size and FS check can complete in a finite time, you know, hours, a couple hours. But, you know, for many users, that's still too long. Um, seems actually FS check times have been around a couple of hours for the last 10 years. So that's not bad as the file systems grow, but zero is better. Um, and, uh, you know, for, especially for, for you know, smaller sites, um, you know, commodity JBODs are, you know, close to reality. There's still some plumbing inside the ZFS code to, uh, really make that, you know, hot sparing and fault detection and analysis um, robust on Linux. But if you're administrating, you know, a couple, handful of systems, that's okay. If you're, you know, at a few tens of petabytes, uh, that's not okay if you have 30,000 disks. So you can't repair your RAID by hand all the time. Um, and ZFS provides lots of, you know, interesting features to move t towards in the future. And actually a surprise benefit of ZFS is that because, you know, ZFS is like a drop-in module, um, you don't have to patch the kernel to run Lustre servers, which is kind of nice. LDISCFS, of course, we don't, you know, we're getting away from kernel patches, but we still have to patch LDISCFS itself, right? And so while you'll be able to have a, you know, technically a patchless kernel to build an LDISCFS file system, you know, around this time as well, but um, you still have to have the kernel sources and kernel specific LDISCFS patches and ZFS doesn't need that, which is great. And because Lustre is the protocol doesn't really know about the backing storage, 
um, it's by and large 1.8 clients don't even know that you've switched over to ZFS. There's a couple of minor issues. Um, one is the client assumes you know a block size that is smaller than or equal to the page size, and so a few a few areas that had to be fixed, you know, maximum object size and that kind of stuff. But you know that's all been handled. Um, so HSM is another project that's been you know a long time in the making, and um, you know we've started taking a serious um, poke at that, um, you know, in the last few months. And um, our goal is that for Lustre 2.4, we'll have the uh, infrastructure and all of the patches landed into 2.4 to be able to run um, HSM on top of. Uh, luster and um, you know there's two components there's the luster part of of, of um, you know HSM the hooks and things for migrating objects and uh, changing the layout from you know an object that's present in the file system to you know an object that's only present in the archive and so the good thing is is that that interface is is relatively simple and um, you know there's other work uh, being done for other archives but the, the ones that are for sure ready, um, HPSS and another interface, the POSIX interface, which is essentially just copy a file from you know, the Lustre file system into some other archive that looks like a file system. It can be you know, another Lustre file system or uh, you know, originally it was done for SAMQFS, which also provides a file system interface. So the tools are for making it uh, move to a new archive are fairly straightforward. And it also gives us you know, a lot of uh, cool infrastructure for um, you know, future projects, um, data migration between OSTs for for files, um, you know, lets you restripe or empty OSTs, or um, you know, you're de decommissioning some hardware. It's an efficient way to to move stuff in the background. Your applications don't have to be stopped or anything while you're moving files. Um, and also the hook, um, which you know needs a little bit of more work, but is you know, facilitated by the HSM work is asynchronous data mirroring, um, which I, I have a little uh, talk about in a minute. Um, the other good thing about HSM is it provides a, a user space policy engine, which lets you, you know, do all of these things automatically, right? It, you can do by path and by user and file size and age and, you know, a, a number of different um, um, uh, attributes of the file. And then it manages, okay, you know, do we keep this in, you know, in Lustre, do we make a copy after five minutes it's been closed and, you know, we start making a copy in the archive and then when we're above 80% full, you know, we can release the old files and the same would, would be usable for um, migration, right? Is one OST wildly more full than others? Instead of pushing off to the archive, we can rebalance or, you know, which files do users specify that need mirroring? You know, there's there's lots more that we can go, or even um, tiers inside the file system, right? It, because we have a simple copy interface for the the backend archive, you know, that file system can be the same file system inside of Lustre, right? It's just that this is you know flash OSTs, and these are disk OSTs, and these are you know really slow SATA OSTs or something like that. And beyond that, um, there's still a couple of projects that. Um, you know, under op open SFS, um, uh, you know, purview for finishing on off uh, phase two of distributed namespace. That's um, striping for a single directory, and um, so that's um, scheduled for the 2.5 timeframe and the later phase of um, the online checking. So once we have distributed namespace, now you have a consistency issue potentially between. Uh, multiple metadata servers, and so then we need a, a online scrub for, you know, verifying that this file over here, you know, has a parent directory on the other MDT, and vice versa, right? That you're pointing at a file that exists on a different server, and um, the uh, Open SFS Technical Working Group is um, prioritizing uh, some other future features that, you know depending on their delivery schedule will be, you know, starting in 2.4, 2.5. And, um, you know, as has previously been mentioned, the, uh, you know, we've been doing requirements gathering from member organizations and from the community. And um, we're currently in the process of, you know, 
looking at the list of, of um, features that have been proposed and developing a short list that can be voted on by OpenSFS members. Um, and there's a meeting this afternoon where we're going to be discussing some of those things. And you know, this is a great reason, as I've been said, to join OpenSFS um, so you can really contribute and steer the direction of Lustre. Um, you know, not have time to go into all of these things in detail, um, but you know, see there's some of the proposed features, you know, having been listed here, these are just ones that are under consideration. There's no, no um, you know, statement that these are guaranteed to be in 2.5 or even that they're scheduled for 2.5, but these are the ones that are on the table at least. Um, you know, so the asynchronous object mirroring and migration um, I think is a really um, a broad uh, feature of interest to both um, you know, large sites and small sites. Um, storage tiering again, it, you know, it um, you know is the wave of the future. We're just getting different, you know, uh, classes of storage that need to be treated separately, and um, you know, having a quota mechanism to control access or usage or uh, of those tiers is uh, important. And uh, complex file layouts is something that we've been missing for a while in Luster. You know, so that lets you do things like. You know, store the first megabyte of a file or a small file on the metadata server, right? And it would be, you know, high IOPS backing storage. Um, you know, and then you can store large parts of the file, you know, big files on on the OSTs or, you know, add stripes to a file as it grows larger, which is, you know, users would like to see that. Um, and so each of these features can be developed and deployed and, you know, will provide benefits in isolation. But, um, you know, once we have them together uh, and, you know, policy engines that will, will do these things automatically for you, I mean, it really provides powerful features. Um, there's more work on uh, availability. Um, you know, LNET uh, in large sites is difficult to, to configure and manage. It uses module parameters. You know, it's, it's not so easy. Um, potentially LNET channel bonding, and there's a presentation on IPv6. Um, large-scale uh, health networks to, you know, detect and, uh, you know, start recovery more quickly and complete recovery more quickly for the health networks. Uh, avoiding ping overhead is a significant issue on large-scale systems. Another talk on that today. That's kind of sort of like a introduction for every other presentation here. <laughs> um, better luster management, configuration management. You know, those are things that have been, you know, the, the wish list of users for a long time. Um, and, you know, it all should always be mentioned that, um, you know, every feature release has a lot of, of uh, hard work behind the scenes. You don't get a, uh, you know, speaking spot up here because you fixed 20 bugs. But, you know, that's work that has to be done. Um, you know, going to new kernels on the client and the server you know, minor performance improvements, usability, all of those things are important. And, you know, that doesn't happen without, um, you know, the, the top tier members of OpenSFS, you know, funding that work. And, um, you know, we've, we've been doing this for a long time and it, it uh, it's, you know, shows the benefits of this background work. And that's it. Um, I have a minute for questions. Give him Mike here. Sarps on his way. Close. Uh, talk to Mike. Did you have a plan to include a 1.8 or 2.0 to analyze this conversion? Um. Because, uh, Yeah, so the question is about the file system conversion tool from 1.8 to 2.x. Um, so there's there's two viewpoints on that. Um, so you don't strictly need a tool to convert. Um, it's more like an optimization tool in some regards. And, um, you know, that's something that um, Zyrtex has been working on. And, you know, I had discussions with um, Vitaly about this and we sort of 
came to an impasse because some of the changes that were being made um, aren't handled if you do an upgrade and then a downgrade again like data and directory because you store the FID there and the 1.8 um, client and server code doesn't understand that that should be ignored um, but I think we could you know definitely come to uh, an agreement um, in getting that included right and you know there's there's no because something isn't listed here doesn't mean that it, it can't land it's just that um, you know if when it's ready um, you know it can be landed yeah Yeah, no, so by all means, uh, to be clear, not being listed here does not mean that it can't land, right? It's it's uh, can land whenever, um, you know, we get to an agreement. So, uh, second question. As I see in your presentation, you have planned to include L to R cache in the last one. Uh, that's only in... As, as Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. So no. To be clear, the L2 arc that's integrated with ZFS, and it's 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 only so down at that level. So, so there's no, no plan. No. 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 no that's that's just a feature of ZFS. Yeah. Sorry for the confusion there. Oh, funny that you asked that. It's it's a question that comes up every time with ZFS. Um, you know, I don't know. Should I take time and answer this, or I'm done? Go ahead. We'll, we'll just delay. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm not a lawyer. You know, don't don't take my word as gospel here. But this is a, a you know issue that I've been involved with for several years already. Um, so ZFS. Uh, first and foremost is not a derived work of, of Linux and um, you know that's clear because it came from Solaris and uh, so these are some important you know non-lawyer people's opinions on um, works that are not derived from Linux and in particular Linux is talking about AFS um, which was developed at uh, CMU and you know it's a file system module and he Linus has said clearly that non-derived works don't have to be licensed under GPL and um, so the second important point is that ZFS itself is um, open source unlike already existing modules like uh, NVIDIA and GPFS are proprietary binary modules and they live in the kernel just fine and you know ZFS is an open source mo module and it you know shouldn't be treated worse than these other binary modules and um, you know there's there's a you know potential conflict between GPL and CDDL um, you know there's there's absolutely no contention in my mind if people combine um, you know Lustre and ZFS on their own and don't redistribute it. There's no question about that. The GPL clearly states that you can make any kind of changes. You don't have to redistribute it yourself, right? So there's no issue there. Um, there's, you know, potentially tricks you could do for combining them at the end user. You know, your GUI could say, do you want to install G ZFS? You know, you click yes, and it fetches a module from somewhere, right? So you're not distributing it together. You know, you have a memory stick in a secure environment, whatever. You build it yourself. Those are all solutions for vendors it's a little bit more tricky the the um, the potential is that I mean CDDL itself gives you patent licenses in all kinds of things so ZFS is not a danger for use or patents and other companies that sell support and you know use ZFS on Solaris open Solaris and so there's no danger from using the ZFS code itself but the only real danger is somebody in the GPL community feels that ZFS somehow infringes upon their rights and they would have to launch a lawsuit against you know this vendor to say 
ZFS somehow, I don't know how they would think this, but maybe, um, infringes upon Linux somehow, and their normal remedy would be you have to make that code open source, right? And you have to make it GPL, but it's already there, it's open source, and since you're not the owner of that code, you would have no ability to make it, you know, a GPL license. So the worst thing they could possibly do after, you know, a lawsuit would be to say, don't ship them together. But I, I don't think that that's, you know, going to happen. Somebody in the Linux community would have to prove that they've been infringed and that I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, that's up to, to every company to make their own decision. Okay, let's give uh, Andreas a hand.